for your sweet presence, oh Lord. Thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your love, your grace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, your presence is so sweet. We honor you and bless your name and thank you for your goodness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team, for leading us into the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do we have the recap video ready from the women's conference? Let's play that real quick. You all can be seated. When I feel like I've had all I could take, like I'm about to break, he's the one I Faith Over Fear, our 13th Women's Conference here, and we had a fabulous time. And it, if you saw them with the big mallet and the card that had things written on it, we told the ladies, go out there, write your fear on that car, and then take it out on it. Just wear it out. And so we did, and we even got Pastor out there. I got a, a small thing, and he went to wearing out a uh, fear, uh, fear over sickness and, and tore it up. So I was, thank you, Jesus. Amen. So also, I don't know that they mentioned this Friday, we will have our Awaken Run, Radiant Run. It will be an evening run at 730. So if you want to know of a way to support life and babies, pro-life, then go out in the foyer or go to get one of our cards, the QR code, and sign up for the Radiant Run. You don't have to run. You don't have to walk. You can if you want to. And uh, in fact, Pastor's going to be here, and you can help me with him, get him walking and moving some. So, and if you want to just sit there and eat and watch us as we come by, that's okay too. Just come out and support. 100% of the money goes to the pro-life organizations. There are five that we will be supporting, and one of those is a national organization that lobbies and fights in D.C. for life. So join us for the run. Did the ushers pass out the scriptures that I have, that we pass out? I, we printed enough for everyone to have them today. It's the faith over fear scriptures. So if you'll make sure that everyone has a scripture, and it's very tiny print, y'all. Now, my notes are written in like 28 font. <laughs> That's so I don't have to put glasses on and off. But I don't know what this is. I think this must be like 12 font or something like that. It's tiny. So, and I already cut like 30 scriptures off of there. So it's not an exhaustive list on speaking words, faith, or fear. But it's a list to get you started so that you can dig into your Bible and find scriptures that when the enemy begins to attack you, you pull something out real quick and you can start quoting the word. And that's what we're going to talk about today. 
So I'm gonna pray over the message right now. Lord, I thank you for your goodness, I thank you for your grace, and I thank you for your word. Your word does not return void, it is truth. And I thank you, Lord, today that you are going to awaken your word inside of every person in this sanctuary. And Lord, that when they leave today, they will feel empowered with your word to resist the works of darkness and the enemy and to speak words of faith over every situation that they have in their life. Lord, we thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. So when I was growing up as a child at home, we lived out in the country. There were a few houses around us, but it was dark out there. We didn't have street lights. When, when I married Pastor and moved here and there were street lights, I was like, what in the world? Y'all, it's light everywhere. But when I was a child, I would wake up at night and my parents had paneling. How many of y'all remember? the old paneling that they put on the walls. And during the daytime, the paneling looked fine. But at night, when you're a kid and you wake up and you look at that paneling, you begin to see faces in that paneling. And I would wake up sometimes and I'd see that and I would get scared. Like, what in the world's on that wall? And I'm not the type of person to just sit there if I'm scared. I've gotta move, I gotta get up. And so I would get up and I would go down the hall to my parents' room. And I never went to my mom's side because mama would send me back to bed. I would go to my daddy's side and I could go up beside daddy and I'd say, daddy, I'm scared. And daddy would put his arms around me and he would pull me into bed with him and mama and I would go right back off to sleep because my daddy was strong. My daddy was strong, he was courageous, he was strict. I grew up in a home where there were rules and you obeyed those rules. And, but I knew my daddy could overcome any obstacle that would come against us. I even remember as a child that um, we would jump off in places and jump into daddy's arms and daddy would always catch us. Or he would teach us to swim. He would, he would throw us into a pond and we would have to swim, but I knew my daddy was there that if I didn't come up and swim, that he would get me. They don't do stuff like that nowadays, do they? <laughs> so there was a faith that he could overcome any obstacle. Today I watch as my sons and other men in the church, they'll take their babies and throw them up in the air and the baby's laughing and happy and daddy catches them as they fall. So we have a faith in our parents that they will always be there and catch us. We will get on an airplane and we'll check in, go through the gate, get on that airplane and have faith that that airplane's gonna take us where we want to go or we wouldn't get on it. We have faith in many things today. So today we're going to talk about a faith and a fear that we need to begin to speak, a fear that we will speak against and a faith that we will embrace. And I want the video now and God said. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty, and waters and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. The second day, God said, put an expanse between the waters on the earth and the waters above. And God called the expanse sky. On the third day, God said, Let dry ground appear and separate the waters on the earth. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and waters he called seas. And 
God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the land produce vegetation, plants and trees, The land produced plants and trees bearing fruit according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. The fourth day God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the sun to govern the day, and the moon to govern the night. He also made the stars and set them in the expanse of the sky. And God saw that it was good. On the fifth day, God said, Let the waters be filled with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every winged bird according to its kind. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. The power of speech. That's not just a beautiful video. God said, and if you question if that really happened, all you have to do is walk out the doors and you'll see the sky and you'll see the ground, you'll see the trees and the birds because God said, it wasn't just an explosion, God said that it would be so. Look at the person beside you. Now whether you think so or not, they're made in the image of God. Whether they look like it or act like it, it doesn't matter. They are made in the image of God. Jewish people read the first five books of the Old Testament, and that's called, to them, they call it the Torah. We as Christians call it the Pentateuch. It's uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They read, I asked my Jewish friend, I said, why, why is it that you concentrate on just the first five books of the Bible? And she said, because God said. Said in the prophets, Psalms and Proverbs, God speaks the inspired word of God. So it's the word of God, but he spoke it through man. And, and then it was given to us. But in those first five books, God said, he spoke directly. And then we know that his word is accomplished. It, it, it occurs just as he said. But then as Christians, as New Testament Christians, the Lord has given us five books of the Bible in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. And there's a certain Bible that we can get that says Jesus said, and what is highlighted in it? It's the red letter edition. And anytime Jesus says something, it's highlighted in red. So I'll give you an example. Jesus is the Son of God. He's the second person of the Trinity. Matthew 8, 2. And behold, there came a leopard and worshiped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, and this would be red letter, I will be thou clean, and immediately his leprosy was cleansed. In this scripture, we see that Jesus healed a leopard. He spoke and he touched, and the leper was healed. Matthew 8, 23, and when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but Jesus was asleep. And his disciples came to him and said, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, 
Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Now notice Jesus has not even rebuked the storm yet, but he rebukes the disciples first because Jesus was in their ship and they said to Jesus, Lord, save us, we perish. They spoke a negative thing out of their mouth. They didn't trust that Jesus on their ship would save them. And so Jesus rebuked them immediately. Then he arose and he rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great calm. Jesus had authority over nature because he was at creation when the world was created and when the seas were created and when the oceans were created and the waves. So he stood up and commanded and they obeyed. Matthew 8, 28. And when he, Jesus, was come to the other side into the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs. And they were exceeding fierce so that no man might pass that way. And behold, they, who is they? They cried out saying, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, the son of God? Who's they? It's the demonic spirits. They are crying out, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, son of God? So they know who Jesus is because they are fallen angels and they were in heaven. So they knew who Jesus was that he was already, he was the son of God. And then they said, art thou come hither to tor torment us before the time? And then there was a good way off from them, a herd of many swine feeding. I wanna go back to that before the time. So the demonic spirits know that there is a set amount of time that they have to torment people. And then they're going to the abyss. And they know that, it's already pre-planned. And so this was when Jesus was walking the earth that the spirits already said, are you going to torment us before you send us to the abyss on the appointed day? So there was a good way off from them, a herd of many swine feeding. So if there's swine feeding, you know it's not Jewish herders there, that it is Gentiles. So the disciples besought him saying, if thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, one word, go. And when they were come out with the one word, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. There are many scriptures in the New Testament that say Jesus said. Whatever he spoke happened just as like when God said something, it happened. He didn't have to speak a lot of words. He could speak one word and demons would leave. That's all he had to speak, one word. Or he could go to the Mount of Beatitudes and he could teach long passages to people and teach them about good things and how we should be and how we should act, the good things of God. The point here is if we speak the words of God, if we speak the words of Christ, then we are speaking words that are fulfilled. One day as I was praying, I kept hearing in my spirit and being impressed with prophesy. And I would pray and I would hear prophesy. And I started saying, Lord, what, it, what do you mean by prophesy? And then it began to, to come to me, prophesy the word, prophesy the word. And so then I began to have scriptures flow through my mind. Isaiah 55, 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Jeremiah 1, 9, the Lord said unto me, behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Where is his word? It's in your mouth. And then he said in 12, I will hasten to perform it. Mark 13, 31, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So if we prophesy God's word in context, he says, I will perform it. That is why what we speak is so important. Our words should not be carelessly spoken. Matthew 12, 36, 37, but I say unto you, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account of thereof in the day of judgment. 
For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Zachary, my grandson, my oldest grandson, was about eight years old, and I picked him up at school one day, and like little boys at eight years old, he gets in the car, and the first thing he says is, no, no, I'm starving to death. And I said, Zachary, no, you're not. You're not starving. Yes, I am. No, no, I'm starving to death. And I said, Zachary, you may be hungry, but you're not dying. You're not starving to death. And so I began to think about that. We say a lot of things, don't we? We say a lot of things that we really don't mean. Things like, my legs are killing me. Are your legs really killing? No, they're not killing you. They're hurting, but they're not killing you. Or this is my sister's, one of her favorite sayings, I about had a stroke. And I'm like, no, you didn't. Don't say that. <laughs> or they about gave me a heart attack. They scared me so bad. No, you're not having a heart attack. You are driving me crazy. That's probably said to a lot of people, a lot of teenagers and children. Or you make me sick at my stomach. No, they don't, or I felt like killing them. No, you didn't. And there's a new one nowadays that they say, don't mess with me, I'll cut you. Uh, isn't that right? So negative words, the negative words we say, listen to this statement. Negative words, write it down. Negative words lead to unbelief, and unbelief blocks spiritual blessings. Negative words lead to unbelief, and unbelief blocks spiritual blessings. Now, God knows when we say things that we don't mean. He knows that. But I think we can figure out a better way to talk. How important is it, the things we say? So Joshua 6.10, and Joshua had commanded the people saying, you shall not shout, nor make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout. Where did that happen? Jericho. Now, why did Joshua tell the people that? Keep your mouth shut, don't say a word. Joshua said that because he had witnessed the death of every one of those people who were at Jericho. He had w witnessed the death of their mothers, their fathers, everyone that was 20 years and older. And why did they die? Because of their mouth. They spoke against God time and time again. They didn't trust God to do what he said he would do. So. Joshua wasn't going to have anybody saying anything that would stop them from going into Jericho. Parents, we as parents and grandparents, sometimes we are guilty of saying things to our children that we really shouldn't say. Negative confessions over children, even in jest, should not be spoken. Speak great things over your children. Speak great things over your family. Speak great things over your spouse, over your friends. Speak good things. It takes some time and thinking and retraining your brain and your lips and your mind, but you can do it. Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. If that is true, then we began to talk differently because what we speak with our mouth grows fruit. Fruit will grow, whether it's good fruit or whether it's bad fruit, we are going to grow fruit. Instead of saying, my child doesn't want to come to church, my child, my spouse, doesn't want anything to do with God or hear anything about it, let's say John 10, 27, my child shall hear the voice of the Lord. John 10, 28, my child has eternal life. My husband, my wife has eternal life and no one can snatch them out of his hand. Instead of saying, I have bad luck, how about 1 Peter 1, 18, I am redeemed from the curse of the law. Instead of saying, you are a failure, how about Romans 8, 37, I am more than a conqueror. My family 
doesn't love me. How about Deuteronomy 32.10? I am the apple of my father's eye. Instead of saying, I am sick and I am dying. How about 1 Peter 2.24? I am healed by the stripes of Jesus. There are so, those are some things that we can speak and we can know that the fruit is good. When my mouth speaks, my mind listens. I prayed recently with a girl who came forward and said, I have thoughts of suicide. I keep thinking of suicide. So I handed her some scriptures right then. I said, I want you to read what you've got in your hand. And she began to read the word of God. I said, what are you thinking? She said, I'm thinking what I'm reading. I said, that's what you need to do every time the devil brings thoughts of suicide into your mind. Every time the devil brings evil thoughts into your mind, you pick up the word and you start reading the word and then you'll begin to think the word and then you become the word. It becomes a part of you. So point two, words of faith. Where does faith come from? Romans 10, 17. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Where is faith stored? Romans 10, 8. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. It's stored in your mouth and in your heart. We are people of faith. People of faith speak words of faith. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. After Jesus had 40 days of temptation, he defeated the devil with three scriptures from the word. Hebrews 4, 12 says the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. From the Greek, that two-edged sword means that it's one side of that sword is the word of God when it leaves his mouth. The other edge of the sword is when the word of God leaves your mouth, when you speak the word of God from your mouth. And Ryan Hart Bonnke said that the word of God coming from your mouth is just as powerful as when it left his mouth because he honors his word above his name. Hallelujah. Mark eleven twenty three. For verily I say unto you that whosoever, are you a whosoever? Yes. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, What things soever you desire. Now there's a caveat to that little desire part there. That means if you desire things that are God things, but if you desire your neighbor's wife or the, your neighbor's husband, that's not God's desire and you can't have it. And if you get it, that it's not from God, it's from the devil. So you need to make sure that the things that you desire and the things that you speak are his things. So when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. This is a scripture and a word of faith. Matthew 17, 20, he said to them, because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move because nothing, say it with me, nothing, nothing, nothing is impossible for you. Mustard seed faith. Notice the action is on our part. Jesus did his part. When he went to the cross, when he was beaten, when he was crucified, he did his part. He said, it is finished. Isaiah 53, 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And was upon him, and with his stripes, we are healed. I love what Andrew Womack says. He says, there's conversation, I think, going on in heaven sometimes. And I think God the Father must look at Jesus and say, didn't you tell them that you finished that work, that you were crucified, that they were healed, that they were delivered, and they were set free? And Jesus says, yes, Lord, I told them. I told them. And then God says, what's wrong with them then? Why haven't they figured it out? Because you know what? Sometimes we think the shortage is on God's part but it's not. He did his part. We tend to say, Lord, I don't know why you're not healing me. Why haven't you delivered my child? Why haven't you saved my child? Because it has to be somebody's fault, but it can't be our fault. 
Isaiah 53. Um, it has to be a shortage on the Lord's part is what we think. Don't speak the circumstances. Don't tell it the way it is. Speak the end result of what God's word says the outcome will be. The shortage is not on his part. We have to begin to speak words of faith. If your child has a problem with their identity, you need to begin to speak what they were born as and what God intended them to be. If your child has a problem or your husband or someone in your family has a problem with sickness, don't speak the sickness over them. Speak health and healing. If someone has a problem with rebellion, don't say my child is rebellious. You say my child is gonna serve God. Romans 4, 17 says, call those things that are not as though they are. That's not lying when you say, my child is serving God. That's speaking things that are not as though they are. You call your child saved, healed, delivered, set free from the bondages of Satan. Matthew 8, 16 says, when the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word, and he healed all that were sick. How did he cast the spirits out? with his word. Matthew 8, 14 and 15. And when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his mother, his wife's mother, laid and sick of a fever. And he touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she arose and ministered unto them. In this instance, Jesus walked into Peter's home. There was sickness in that home. Jesus walked into that home because he was welcome. I am thankful today that because Jesus is welcome in my home, that when there's a problem, he will walk into my home. When there's sickness in my home, he'll walk right into the room where there's sickness, where someone is falling and he will put his hand there and he will pick them up and he will deliver them and set them free. He will walk into your home no matter what the problem is and he will set you free. He will come into any place that he is welcome. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with leprosy. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with cancer. It doesn't matter if you're dealing with a fever, with blind eyes, deaf ears, a rebellious child, a rebellious spouse. You can have deliverance and Jesus will come Come in there and he will set them free. Our part is to have faith, to move, to worship, to press in and keep speaking the word of God. The last example on this point I'm going to give is the picture of the woman with the issue of blood and her story. Mark 5, 25. Now in this picture, it's in, this picture is in Tiberias in a, a Catholic church and it's beautiful. The floor is the original floor where Jesus would have walked. There's a synagogue near here where Jesus would have taught. And they have this beautiful picture. Mark 5, 25. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind, and she touched his garment, for she said, if I can but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, thou seest the multitude, Lord, it's thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done, came and she fell down before Jesus and she told him all the truth. And he said unto her, daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. Now what we need to see here is once again, the action is on the woman's part. She began to push in. She faced danger because in her condition, bleeding as she was, she could have been stoned, she could have been murdered because she was in a crowd and she was considered unclean and it was illegal for her to be about. So she faced danger, she faced death being present in that crowd. 
And so she began to press in. She saw the crowd. She began to press in and to push. And they were thronging Jesus. And she couldn't get to him easily. They say, it says in the word that she pressed in. She kept pushing. She pushed people aside. And she was walking, seeing Jesus walk. And she saw his garment. And she kept thinking, if I can just get to his garment. And she was probably on her hands and knees. And she was crawling and pushing and no. And she was in trouble and she reached through and she pushed till she touched him and she was healed of her disease. She let nothing stop her. She knew where Jesus was and she was going to get to him. That is faith. I will do whatever I have to do. I will push my way in. I won't be distracted. I won't be pushed aside. I'll turn off the TV. I'll put my cell phone down. I'll turn off social media. I will stop being distracted with all these things that keep me from pushing in. I have a child that needs deliverance. I need healing. I need salvation. I need your help, Lord, and I'm going to push in till I touch your garment because where you are, there is help. When we are in need of a miracle, distractions become less. We don't let things distract us when we, when we need a miracle. The word becomes our, our truth. It becomes our word. And so we began to speak words of faith. It becomes our focus in life. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. To embrace faith is to embrace your father. Just like when I was afraid and I could go to my daddy and I'd say, Daddy, I'm scared. And he wrapped his arms around me. To embrace faith is to embrace my father. That's his nature. His nature is seen in Exodus 34, 6. It says, and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. You want to know who God is? This is who God is. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, forgiving transgression, forgiving sin. That's who our Father is. That's what His nature is. We don't have to question that nature. He tells us who He is. We know that sickness, bondage, problems in life, they don't come from God. It's not God's fault. It is satanic bondage. It is satanic bondage, and you need to be loosed from it. We need to be loosed from it today. Hallelujah. 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 We can be loosed today from satanic bondage, but we have to know the nature of our Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worship team, if you'll come back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the power of fear. There are different kinds of fear. Not all kinds of fear is bad. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So to Fear God is good. It's the beginning of knowledge. But as long as you're on this earth, the devil's going to talk to us. He's going to talk to you. He's going to bring problems and trials our way and circumstances. He's trying to see if you're going to receive those problems. Here's something for you to write down. Fear is always present when faith is absent. Fear is always present when faith is absent. Faith is absent when we walk in disobedience to God. There are many instances in the Bible of paralyzing fear. So we'll go back to the Joshua verse. What preceded? The 12 spies are an example of fear that gripped 10 men, and they swayed an entire nation. The nation of Israel, they swayed to rebel against God's word, 
and suffer 40 years in the desert. Listen to God's word to the children of Israel. Numbers 13, 1 and 2. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I, what? Which I give unto the children of Israel. The 10 spies go in and search out the land of Canaan. And this is the report they bring back. And they told him and said, we came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it flows with milk and honey. And this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak, those are giants. We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. That's paralyzing fear. These are the people who were brought out of Egypt, who crossed the Red Sea, who saw God move and destroy Pharaoh's army. They listened to fact. It was not God's plan for them to listen to those facts. Facts, there was a land that flowed with milk and honey. It was a land filled with beautiful fruits, but it had giants and walled cities. That was fact. But truth said, there is a land that I am giving you. Go in and possess it, and I will make of you a great nation. The facts brought fear. It brought rebellion, and it brought death. The truth would have brought prosperity, luscious food, homes, blessings, and a good life but facts were embraced over truth. There was another man, and I'm gonna summarize because of time. Job 1.1. The Bible says that Job was a perfect and he was an upright man, and he feared God, he loved God, and he had a big family, and his family liked to get together and have family gatherings. But Job had a fear in his heart he feared God, but there was another fear in his heart because after his family would get together, it says that Job would make sacrifices continually, continually he made sacrifices because he was afraid that his children had cursed God. He was afraid that his children had cursed God. And he, when the attack came, Job said, for the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which is I was afraid of is come unto me. So having fear, a fear that consumes us, is a wrong fear. It's not wrong to be concerned about our children, to pray over them, to be concerned about our spouse, to pray over them. That's not wrong, that's a good thing. But it's when we fear, and the attack came from who? Who did the attack on his family come from? Satan, it didn't come from God. The attack came from Satan. God has given us the blood of Jesus. He's given us the word. He's given us words of faith. So instead of fearing for our families, we speak the word of God over our families. We declare the word of God. We plead the blood of Jesus over our families. We walk in faith and we call those things that are not as though they are. We speak words of faith over our children, over our families, over our homes, over our church, over our city, and over our nation. I don't speak words of destruction over my nation. I speak words of faith that if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray, then he will hear from heaven. He will forgive our sins and he will heal our land. That's what I speak over our nation because Reinhard Bonnke and the word of God says that our nation can be saved. It can be healed. And I believe it will be healed and it will be saved. We declare that. When we give in to lies, 
When we give in to fear, we are embracing the father of lies. We are embracing the one who has been defeated. We fear God, meaning we reverence God. We honor the Lord God Almighty. We honor the omnipotent one. We honor the master of the universe, the omniscient one, the omnipresent one, the most high God, the God that is above all, the God that is in all, that is above all, that's through all, the God that is all, uh, creator of everything. That is who we worship. We worship the God who went into hell, who took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And the Bible says that God took Jesus took the keys and then he made a public display of the devil. He led him on a parade and the Bible says he shamed him openly. And that is who we worship is God our Father. But when we embrace fear, then we embrace the father of lies. We embrace the defeated one. We embrace the one that has been put to shame. The victory for us is already won. It's got to come from our mouth. Psalm 34, 4, I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Romans 8, 38, 39, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I want you to repeat with me the last one is the altar team comes. Psalms 118.6. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. Stand with me. Say it again. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. I will speak words of God. I will speak words of faith. So shall my word be that goes from my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. I will speak his word. I will not repeat and embrace the lies of the enemy. I will have a mustard seed faith. His plans for me are good and they are not evil, but they are plans to bless me, to give me a hope and to give me a future. I reject, repeat it with me. I reject the lies of the enemy. I reject the lies of the enemy. I reject the fears of the enemy. I reject it and I embrace truth. I embrace God's word for my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the first part of our altar call today, I want us to, to give an invitation to those who don't know Jesus as their personal Savior. If you don't know Jesus or you have family that doesn't know Jesus, I want you to come forward right now and allow one of these prayer workers to begin to speak faith words over your family, over your spouse, your child, or someone that you are burdened for. I want you to come forward now and allow someone to pray with you. And we're going to pray a prayer of, of uh, forgiveness of sins, the ABCs of salvation, a prayer of salvation. It's one that I pray all the time with people who don't know Jesus because Jesus made salvation simple. He made it easy. It's not hard. So if Right now, if you have someone that you're praying for and that you want someone to pray with you, move. Let's move. Press in right now. Be like the woman who pressed through the crowd. Don't sit there. Come on, just move and, and have someone agree with you in faith that your loved one or your friend is going to come to know Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 As these come, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on a cross for my sin. Thank you for the shed blood of Jesus. I admit that I am a sinner. I believe you are the Son of God. I confess my sins and I confess you as my Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, if you prayed that prayer, then you're saved. You're a Christian. But I want to encourage you to fill out a card so that we can send you some material so that it will help you in your walk with the Lord. Now, this next call is for those of you who are sick or those of you who have 
problems and issues of fears, things that you need someone to pray with you about. I want you to come forward now, and I want you to have someone pray with you and speak words of faith with you over things that you need defeated in your life or in someone's life that you know. Maybe you know someone that's bound by fear, that's bound by bondage, that's bound with are young people that are having such a problem with identity today. You know someone that needs a breakthrough. They need miracles in their lives. They need someone to agree. There's power in agreement. When you agree with someone over a need, there is power. One will put a 1,000 to flight, but two will put 10,000 to flight. So come forward and allow someone to pray with you and uh, see bondages lifted and see sin broken in people's lives, see healing take place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worship team, if you'll play as we pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
you, Lord, for sealing your word. Thank you that we will walk out of here victorious. Lord, and for all of these that have come forward, as they continue to pray, Lord, that you will minister to their every need, that you will comfort hearts, set people free. Lord, we thank you that you are a good, good, good Father. Hallelujah. 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 So we're going to give the ironic blessing. So if you'll lift your hands. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons. Thus shall you bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, y'all. We love you. Y'all have a great Sunday. Amen.